Hello, my name's Bob Chorley. In the last tutorial, I used keyframes to animate a shape in a mat so that it would follow an object on the screen. In this tutorial, I'm going to explain more about keyframes and I'll also take a look at Baselight's auto trackers. I'll start off by opening the project we were working on before. There was a shot in this commercial where I needed to change the colour of the lipstick. If you remember, I used a hue angle key to create a mat which restricts the grade to just the red colour of the lips. Although the key is pretty good, if you look closely you can see that there are other similar shades of red which are being included in the mat. This wasn't too noticeable when I applied the grade as I was using a hue shift and the other areas affected are relatively small. However, if I want to completely isolate and grade just the lipstick, then I can add a garbage mat to the key. I'm going to add a simple ellipse by enabling the shape operator in the same column as the hue angle key. Notice that as soon as I do this, the mat disappears completely. This is because I don't yet have a shape to combine with the key, and as the combine mode is always intersect for shapes and keys in the same column, the resultant mat is currently empty. This makes it a bit tricky to know where to draw the garbage mat. However, if I enable the fill on empty button, the shape layer will temporarily be filled with white until I create a shape. This enables us to see the key. I can now draw my garbage mat around the area of the mouth. By the way, I find that I draw ellipses more often than any other shape, so I've set ellipse to be my default curve mode in the customize menu. As in the previous tutorial, where I added a moving ellipse to restrict a highlight grade to just the areas of the face, I'll need to animate this ellipse so that it follows the mouth. First, I'll switch the display mode to layer matte overlay by pressing Shift O, then I'll jump to the first frame of the shot by pressing the home button on the keyboard. I'm now moving the ellipse into position using the middle trackball on the artist color. You can of course drag it with the mouse instead if you want to. Okay, I need to add a keyframe to the shape's motion. However, before I do that, I'm going to turn off the stripe keyframes button. I'll explain what that does later on. I'll also set the keyframe interpolation mode to smooth. Now I'll jump to the end of the shot by pressing end on the keyboard and reposition the ellipse. This automatically creates another keyframe. In this shot the motion starts at the first frame and ends at the last so it makes sense to initially add keyframes at these two points. Now I'm going to drag the cursor to the point where the mouth is approximately midway between its start and end positions which is roughly halfway through the shot and again I'll reposition the shape here. The aim is to animate the garbage mat with as few keyframes as necessary. So let's see how that looks. Well it's close, but if I switch over to selection output and then turn the mat overlay back on by pressing O, we can see how well the garbage mat fits around the key. OK, I'm just going to add a couple more keyframes to keep it nicely lined up. Well that just about works, but I can probably get it to fit better by adding a rotation to the ellipse. Each of these shape motion keyframes stores the position, scale and rotation of this shape. That means that at each of these points in the timeline, the ellipse will be rotated as we see it here. So if I place the cursor between existing keyframes and then adjust the rotation, a new keyframe is added with that rotation, but as soon as we play towards the next keyframe, the shape rotates back to its original orientation. With shape motion keyframes, there's no way to separate out the position, scale and rotation. It's therefore better to modify existing keyframes than to keep adding new ones. To jump quickly to existing keyframes, you can use the left and right square brackets on the keyboard. So first I'll remove this extra keyframe I just added by jumping to it, that's the left square bracket, and then clicking on the shape motion keyframe button. Notice that the button turned from a blue key to a grey one, indicating that there's no longer a keyframe at this position in the keyframe bar. The keyframe buttons work like that. You press them once and it adds a keyframe. If there's already a keyframe there and you click on the button again, then the keyframe is removed. Now I'll use the right square bracket to jump to the last keyframe and adjust the shape's rotation using the middle ring on the artist colour. I'll also rotate the shape a small amount on the previous keyframe 
but I think it's okay to leave it as it is on all the others. So the garbage mat now tracks the mouth pretty well, and as the motion is quite smooth and continuous, the smooth interpolation mode between keyframes matches it quite well. In some cases, however, it may be better to use a linear interpolation. For example, if you're just using two keyframes to follow an object which is already moving at a constant rate across the screen. The third option applies an S-shaped interpolation between keyframes. This has the effect of easing in and out of each keyframe point. In most cases, for continuous movement, you would use the smooth interpolation mode. But if, for example, you're tracking an object which is stationary, then starts to move and then stops again, the S-curve may fit better as it provides a sort of natural acceleration and deceleration to the motion. Again, it's probably a case of try each one and see what fits best. One thing to note is that the chosen interpolation mode applies to all the keyframes for this parameter. However, other parameters can use different interpolation modes to this one. The last option on this button is constant, and if I select that, it reverts this parameter back to the constant mode. In other words, it removes all the shape motion keyframes for this shape. If I clicked on that button by accident, I can of course undo that click by using Command Z on the keyboard, or undo from the edit menu. Now I keep saying this shape, because of course you could have a more complex mat made up of several shapes. Each one of those shapes can have its own set of animation keyframes. If I want to view the keyframes of a specific shape independently of the other shapes in this mat layer, I need to click on the keyframe filter button here and choose selected shape. If I now add another shape, just to show how this works, we can then animate that shape independently of the first one. Okay, so the second shape just has two keyframes and an S-curve interpolation, whereas the first one uses smooth interpolation, and you can see that I've not affected the motion of the first shape at all by adding the second shape. Incidentally, I can switch between the different shapes without having to click on them with the mouse by pressing Command N on the keyboard. Okay, I'll delete the second shape and go back to the graded image by clicking on the grade button up here. Now tracking that garbage map was pretty straightforward and didn't take long to set up as we only needed a few keyframes to accurately track the motion. However, sometimes you may need a lot more keyframes, especially if you have a much tighter garbage mat. In that case, it would probably be better to use the auto tracker. So let's have a look at that now. I'm going to use this same garbage mat to illustrate. First, let's remove all the animation by selecting constant mode for this shape. Now I'm going to track the motion of the mouth using a simple one-point tracker. With the shape selected, I click on the New One Point Track button. As you can see, a tracker target has been placed on the image at the centre of the shape. The tracker target consists of two rectangles. The inner rectangle is the part of the image which the tracker will try to automatically locate on each frame, and the outer rectangle is the area within which it will search. Over on the left here, you can see an enlarged black and white version of the centre rectangle. You can change the size and shape of both these rectangles to include more or less detail in the target area and also to increase or decrease the area over which it will search. This can be done using these sliders or the controls on the artist colour. Clearly, the larger the area it's trying to match and the larger the search area, the longer the process will take. But in some cases, especially with fast moving objects, you may need to extend the search area so that the target can be detected on every frame. Before I start the tracking process, I'll make sure that Acquire Search Template Every Frame is enabled. This will update the search image on each frame, allowing it to adapt to changes in this part of the image. This generally leads to a more accurate track, and it's the default setting. However, sometimes you may find you need to disable this in order to track an object completely. So to start the track, I just click on the Track Forwards button. As you can see, it's created a motion curve by plotting the centre of the search target on each frame. As I step forward through the frames, you can see the target image here on the left. It tracks pretty well, despite the rotation, but at this point it starts to slip as the target becomes obscured by the hair. 
In some cases, it may be possible to choose a different target which doesn't get obscured, but in this case, I can't do that. So what I'll do is step through to the last frame where the tracker was in the correct place, and then delete the forward results by clicking on this button. I'm now going to step forward to the first frame where the mouth is visible again. That's about here. Now I click on the New Reference button, which allows me to continue the track from this point onwards. I'll drag the target back over to the mouth, and also move the current track point, which is the one with the yellow diamond around it, to where the centre of our shape should be on this frame. Now I can simply click on the Track Forwards button again to complete the track. Notice that the two points where I defined the target have been marked in the keyframe bar. This means I can quickly jump back to these frames using the left and right square brackets on the keyboard. OK, let's step through that again and see how it looks. Well, even though part of the track was obscured, Baselight is able to interpolate the position, and it looks like it's done a pretty good job. Now we need to track the first part of the shot, as we started this process about halfway through. For that, we can track backwards by clicking on this button. OK, there were no problems with slippage that time. Right, let's see what the animation of our shape looks like now. I can quickly get back to the layer with the shape in it by clicking on the Return to Shape Strip button up here. Well that seems to follow the mouth OK, but as before, we really need to rotate the shape as the mouth rotates. The simplest way to do that is to add a couple of manual shape motion keyframes to rotate the tracked shape. And there we go. Because the tracker data is separate to the shape keyframes, I can apply my own manual adjustments on top of the tracked shape. These adjustments are added to the tracker motion, creating the final combined motion we see here. OK, so that was a simple example where we only basically needed to track the position of an object. This is actually a very common job when working with grade mats, but often you also need to track the rotation and sometimes the scale of an object. The simplest way to do that in Baselight is to use the Area Tracker. For this example, I'm going to use another shot. What I want to do is to alter the saturation and contrast around the eyes without affecting the other parts of the image. To do that, I'll need to create a mat which covers the area around the eyes fairly precisely. First, I need to add a new layer. Now, I'll zoom in on the eyes by dragging with the middle mouse button, and I'm going to use an ellipse to draw a mat around the first eye. OK, so that's the first eye, and now I need to add in the second. I do this by adding a new curve to the shape. I need to create this as a single shape, as the tracker operates on shapes individually, and I don't want to have to track each eye separately, so that's why I'm adding a curve to the shape, rather than adding a second shape. There's a tutorial on our website which explains a lot more about curves and shapes, so it's probably worth having a look at that uh, to fully understand what I'm doing here. OK, now we have a single shape containing two ellipses for the eyes, but you'll notice that the control handle for the shape is over here. I want to have it in the centre, as any scaling and rotation is applied relative to this handle, so I'm going to drag it back into the middle by holding down the command key while I drag on it. OK, so let's track this shape using the Area Tracker. I'll click on the New Area Tracker button, and then on Track Forwards to start the process. Once again, as I started halfway through the shot, I need to track backwards to complete the track. Right, now I'll return to the shape layer and overlay the mat to see how well it lines up. Well, it's not too bad through the middle part of the shot, but at the end, as the image fades to black, the tracker clearly fails. If I switch back to the shape, and return to the tracker, we can step forward to the point where the tracker starts to lose its lock, which is about here, and then delete the forward results. To track the remainder of the shot, I could manually add some keyframes, as I did with the one-point tracker, or I can allow Baselight to extrapolate where it thinks the shape might go next. So let's do that by clicking on the Extrapolate Forwards button. 
Okay, well that looks about right. So now let's go back and fix up the shape at the start of the shot. Well, the problem here is that although the area tracker has accurately followed the eyes, it has interpreted the rotation away from the camera as a scale change, and when applied to the shape mat, this scales it both vertically as well as horizontally. What we need to do is apply a manual adjustment to allow for the unequal change in scale. I'll drag backwards to the point where the scale needs to start changing, and I'll add a shape motion keyframe here. Now I'll drag it back right to the start of the shot and adjust the aspect ratio of the shape using one of the blue corner handles. OK, that's looking a little better, but at the start of the shot the eye at the back is almost completely obscured, so I'm also going to need to adjust the individual curves within the shape. You can change the rotation and scale of the separate curves by selecting their red bounding boxes. You can also drag individual points by clicking on them. Of course, all of these separate adjustments will be animated. OK, well I think that'll probably do. I'm now going to blur the shape a little and then I'll apply the contrast and saturation adjustment to grade the area around the eyes and we'll see how that looks. Well I think you get the idea. I could spend a bit more time tweaking the matte animation but the basic look is about right now. So that shows you how easy it is to track an object even if it's rotating and changing shape as it moves across the screen. In part two of this tutorial I'll show you how to use trackers to stabilize an image in Baselight, and we'll also look at a few other things you can do with keyframes. <laughs>